Hi from New Delhi, you're watching DD India Global. We'll get you top stories from India and the region. I'm Tanvi Tanija. And for news from the rest of the world, I'm joined by my colleague in Washington DC, Benji Haya. Benji, good evening from New Delhi. Good morning, Tanvi. 10 a.m. here in Washington, D.C., 3 in the afternoon across Central Europe. Coming up in the next 30 minutes, military tensions in the South China Sea, Taiwan and Japan are on alert. And we'll have the latest news stateside on this Easter Monday. The cleanup effort from Baltimore's bridge catastrophe is underway. All that after the latest headlines. Israel reports aerial attack on its Red Sea port city of Elat. Iraq's Islamic resistance claims responsibility. Washington confirms US and Israeli officials to meet virtually to discuss Rafah operation today. Islamabad High Court suspends the 14-year sentences of former Prime Minister Imran Khan and wife Bushra Bibi in the Toshakhana graft case. Grant them appeal of conviction. Turkey sees historic opposition win in local elections. President Rajab Tayyip Erdogan calls it a turning point. Istanbul Mayor Ekrem Emamoglu shows up as Erdogan's main rival. And India's gross services tax, GST revenue for the month of March sees the second highest collection ever at 21.45 billion US dollars recording an 11.5% growth year on year. First, Indeed India Global News from West Asia. Israel's Red Sea port city of Elath came under an aerial attack on Monday and smoke was seen rising from a building. The military statement said a flying object launched from east of Israel had struck a building in Elath. Sirens went off in the city, but there was no interception by air defences. The military further added that there were no casualties. The Islamic resistance group in Iraq said in a statement that it had attacked a vital objective in Israel using appropriate weapons. The Israeli army released footage on Monday showing strikes on Hamas targets in Gaza. The Israeli army said troops have exited the Al-Shifa hospital after a two-week operation there, during which the Israeli Defense Force has killed gunmen and seized weapons and intelligence documents. Meanwhile, thousands of Israelis staged a protest in Jerusalem on Sunday, the largest anti-government demonstration since the start of Israel-Hamas conflict. The two sides have stepped up negotiations, mediated by Qatar and Egypt, as ceasefire talks also resumed in Cairo on Sunday. New Zealand Foreign Minister Winston Peters met his Egyptian counterpart, Sameh Shokre, during a visit to Cairo on Monday to discuss the ongoing conflict. DD India's Alex Kadia reports from Tel Aviv. We've seen those images of the area around and the hospital itself absolutely devastated by two weeks of fighting between Israeli forces and uh, Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Of course, the reaction in Israel has been broadly supportive of the IDF's actions. They see it as a necessary evil that their forces are fighting uh, Hamas in uh, the area of the Al-Shifa hospital. But a lot of uh, criticism of that decision to return to the Al-Shifa hospital. Of course, the first time it was raided by Israeli forces was back in November. They then said that they had managed to rid the hospital of all Hamas fighters, but now that they had returned, that's something that Hamas uh, denies, but we have seen two weeks of brutal fighting and uh, the main uh, buildings, the main surgery building, the uh, intensive care unit of the hospital, as well as the emergency uh, department, the general surgery department and orthopedics department buildings, all destroyed. And so it will be a long
long time before that a, a hospital can be operational again. Well, it will continue to increase the international pressure for a deal. There's no doubt about that. You cannot look at the footage of these destroyed hospital buildings and not feel like a ceasefire is now desperately needed, both to release those hostages and for uh, humanitarian aid and medical aid to be able to enter Gaza. But it's very clear, at least from Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu at a press conference just yesterday, he said no international pressure would uh, stop Israel from continuing with its military objective of completely destroying Hamas. That will make the negotiations particularly difficult. We know that one of the real sticking points has been Hamas's uh, uh, demand for a longer ceasefire and for the full withdrawal of Israeli troops from the Gaza Strip. And that, of course, is not something Israel can, can contend with. And their stated objective is the complete destruction of Hamas, the same group that they are negotiating these ceasefire talks with. So we know Israeli officials are in Cairo continuing these discussions, but still a very long road ahead before a deal can be reached. Simon. All right, uh, more from the region. Israeli authorities announced on Monday that the sister of Hamas leader Ismail Hanaya was arrested on terror offences in the Israeli Badam village of Tel Sheva. She will be brought to the Beer Sheva Magistrates Court for a hearing to extend her detention. Ismail Hania, who lives in Qatar, has three sisters, all Israeli nationals who live in Tel Sheva. Meanwhile, U.S. and Israeli officials have planned to hold a virtual meeting on Monday to discuss the Biden administration's alternative proposals to an Israeli military offensive of Rafah. A U.S. official said this. Israel last week asked to reschedule the meeting days after Benjamin Netanyahu abruptly cancelled talks over the passage of a Gaza ceasefire resolution by the U.N. Security Council that the U.S. decided not to veto. The U.S. abstention from the vote pointed to frustration with Netanyahu, who rebuked Washington over the move. Now, staying in the region, Turkey's opposition logged a thumping victory over President Rajab Tayyip Erdogan's AK party in the local polls on Sunday. My colleague Benji Hayer is in Washington, D.C. He takes it forward from here and also gives us uh, on other stories making headlines around the world. Benji, a turning point for Turkey indeed. Tanvi, a major setback for Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan, the main opposition party in the country, securing substantial victories in local elections, maintaining control over crucial cities. The results showcasing the Republican People's Party retaining its grip on key urban areas. Its leader, Ekrem Imagbulo, led by 10 percentage points in the mayoral race in Istanbul. His party retained Ankara, the capital, and gained 15 other mayoral seats in cities nationwide, including Izmir, Bursa, Adana and the resort of Atalya. The nation itself gives the order and the instructions, not just one person. Officials receive instruction from the nation. Period of one man rule is over as of today. It is done. The republic and democracy to go full speed ahead from now on. Today, the voters made a very important decision. The election results showed that the voters decided to establish a new politics in Turkey. The voters decided to change the 22-year-old picture of Turkey and open the door to a new political climate in our country. These election results are blow for President Erdogan. He'd hoped to take back control of cities soon after clinching a third term as president. For the first time in 21 years, his AK parties faced a defeat at the ballot box across the nation. The president says the elections didn't end as he hoped, but he sees it as a turning point, not necessarily an end. March 31st is not an end for us, but a turning point. The Turkish nation has conveyed its message to population by using the ballot box in this March 31st municipal elections. Ukraine says Russia's used five hypersonic Zircon missiles to attack its capital, Kiev, since the beginning of 2024. Kiev's military administration claims Russia launched 180 missiles and drones towards the capital in the first three months of the year alone. There's been no immediate response from Moscow, but 
Russian President Vladimir Putin confirmed in his address on February 29th that Russia had used these missiles, which is part of a new generation of unrivaled arms systems. Now, the latest from Russia's Concert Hall massacre. Sources suggesting that Iran tipped off Russia about the possibility of a major terrorist attack near Moscow last month. Tehran reportedly sharing information with Moscow about a possible big attack inside Russia. And that particular information, we're told, was acquired during an interrogation of those arrested in connection with Iran's twin bombing. However, Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov on Monday denied any Iranian warnings were provided to Russia. Taiwan's Navy chief is expected to visit the United States this week amidst China issuing threats to the self-governing island. Taiwan's Navy chief... Tang Hua is expected to attend a military ceremony and discuss how to boost bilateral naval cooperation with the United States. Last week, a US lawmaker visited Taiwan and reiterated the importance of a continued strategic cooperation between the island and the US. The United States is Taiwan's most important arms supplier and international supporter, despite the absence of a formal diplomatic relationship. DD India's Patrick Fock reports from Singapore. At the US and Taiwan, we're told that Tang Hua will be in Hawaii first, where he will visit the home of the US Indo-Pacific Command before heading on to a conference near Washington on sea, air and space. Uh, we're also told that the Taiwanese side is trying to tee up uh, talks with the head of U.S. naval operations, Lisa Franchetti. But beyond that, it's difficult to say what precisely is on the agenda. Both sides have tried to keep this visit relatively low profile, as is always the case when it comes to Taiwanese officials heading to the U.S. Uh, the Taiwan Navy and the Pentagon have both declined to comment further on what the visit is about. Out, but uh, sources have said that this is also partly about bolstering efforts under the uh, island defense line concept, which is basically about bringing together Japan, the Philippines, Taiwan and Borneo to counter China, particularly as Beijing is becoming increasingly assertive in the Indo-Pacific. And that would make sense when you consider that there is also this trilateral summit that's due to take place in April between Japan. Japan uh, and the Philippines and the US as well. So in terms of timing, this does seem to make sense and works along those lines. Uh, but as to how China's reacted to this, well, as you can imagine, uh, China isn't happy and uh, is opposed to any formal uh, visits by Taiwanese officials. And the foreign ministry uh, has said that it is opposed to, to uh, military collusion of any kind when it comes to Taiwan and the US. Patrick Fock there, staying in the region. And US President Joe Biden is all set to reach an agreement with Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida to allow for repairs of large US military ships in Japan. The move will increase the mobility of the US military in East Asia. President Joe Biden plans to host the Japanese Prime Minister for an official visit to the United States on April 10th. In the U.S., Governor Wes Moore of the state of Maryland has urged Republican Party lawmakers in Congress to work with Democrats to approve the federal government funding needed for the rebuilding of the collapsed bridge in the city of Baltimore to get the port economy back on its feet. The Biden administration released $60 million in initial emergency aid on March 28th to assist in cleaning up debris and reopening the port after a cargo ship smashed into the bridge. Officials have told Maryland lawmakers the final cost of rebuilding the bridge could soar to at least $2 billion. Well, that's it from me here in Washington, D.C. Back to you in the studio, Tanby. You're watching Did India Global, still to come on the show. Preparations on in full swing ahead of 2024 general elections in India.
and Berliners dressed in bunny costumes celebrate Easter Monday with a fun run. As the cycle of accountability returns, the time has come when the biggest democracy chooses to write another chapter in its glorious history. Development, justice, regionalism, a big political canvas. Everything will be put to test in this mega battle for glory. DD India dissects what makes elections 2024, the battle royale in Indian politics. Data and analysis free from bias to help you understand why India matters. The Great Indian election on weekdays at 8.30 p.m. only on TV India. Welcome back. You're watching DD India Global. I am Tanvi Taneja. So, South Koreans will vote on 10th April in a parliamentary election to elect a 300 member National Assembly. The parliamentary and presidential elections are held separately in South Korea. President Yoon Suk Yeol's Conservative People Power Party faces an uphill battle to win back a majority now held by the opposition. Uh, gaping margin of defeat and a looming existential crisis among the ruling party's leadership. On to Pakistan now. In relief for jailed of former Prime Minister Imran Khan and his wife Bushra Bibi, Islamabad High Court on Monday granted them an appeal of their conviction for graft and suspended their 14-year jail sentences. Just a week ahead of February 8th elections, Imran Khan and his wife Bushra were both handed a 14-year sentence on charges of unlawfully selling state gifts. Khan remains in jail after multiple other sentences were imposed on the former cricket star ahead of the national polls, which also disqualified him from holding any public office for 10 years. Coming back to India, Prime Minister Narendra Modi has hit out at uh, Tamil Nadu, India's southern state's ruling party, the DMK, for failing to safeguard the interests of the state. Prime Minister Narendra Modi posted on social media platform X, and I quote him here, rhetoric aside, the DMK has done nothing to safeguard Tamil Nadu's interests. New details emerging on Kachativu have unmasked the DMK's double standards totally. The Congress and the DMK are family units. They only care that their own sons and daughters rise. They don't care for anyone else. Their callousness on Kachitivu has harmed the interests of our poor fishermen and fisherwomen in particular. Unquote. India's External Affairs Minister and BJP leader Dr. S. J. Shankar also hit out at the Congress and the DMK for mishandling the Kachitivu issue. Minister Jay Shankar said that it is an issue that's been debated in the country's parliament and also in Tamil Nadu circles. He said that in the last five years, the Kachativu Island and Fisher Folks issues have repeatedly been raised by various political parties in parliament. He said that in the last 20 years, 6,184 Indian Fisher Folk have been detained by Sri Lanka. And 1,175 Indian fishing vessels were seized, detained or apprehended by Sri Lanka. This is not an issue which has suddenly surfaced. This is a live issue. It is an issue which has been very much debated uh, in parliament, in, the, in uh, Tamil Nadu uh, circles as well. It has been the subject of correspondence between the union government and the state government. Now, every political party uh, in Tamil Nadu has taken a position on this. Two parties, the Congress and the DMK, have approached this matter as though they have no responsibility for it. Minister Jay Shankar's remarks on Kachativu Island drew a response from the Congress party. It said that the Indira Gandhi Srimavo Bandara Naike agreement was signed to save 600,000 Tamils at the time. Government of India, headed by Mrs. Indira Gandhi ji, has signed an agreement called Indira, Indira Gandhi Srimavo Bandara Naike agreement. In that time, to save 6 lakh Tamils. To save them in return, this 
six uh, Kachitiwa Islanders given by the government of India and uh, uh, to the Sri Lankan um, uh, government. We are very clear that if fishermen are, are attacked and if our brothers in fishermen in Ramnath district are attacked, we will, uh, India government, we will raise our voice to take back Kachitiwa. And more on Indian politics now. We get you the latest on the world's largest democratic election in India. So the Election Commission has strongly reprimanded Congress leader Supriya Srinath and BJP leader Dilip Ghosh for their statements and said that the Commission will not tolerate any such statements in future. The Commission also advised them to adhere to the Election Code of Conduct. Tamil Nadu BJP President and Party's Coimbatore candidate K. Anamalai held a roadshow ahead of the Lok Sabha elections. Karnataka Congress Chief and Deputy Chief Minister D.K. Shivakumar campaigned for Soumya Reddy, the party's candidate from Bangalore South Lok Sabha seat. The BJP's manifesto committee meeting under the chairmanship of Union Minister Rajnath Singh is underway at the BJP headquarters in the national capital New Delhi. Piyush Goyal, Ashwini Vaishnav and other party leaders are attending the meeting. Former AAP MP from Punjab's Patiala Dharamveer Gandhi on Monday joined the Congress in the presence of senior party leaders. Dharamveer Gandhi is likely to contest as a Congress candidate from Patiala. India's gross goods and services tax GST revenue for the month of March this year witnessed the second highest collection ever at over 22 billion US dollars with an 11.5 year-on-year growth. The surge was driven by a significant rise in GST collection from domestic transaction at 17.6%. GST revenue net of refunds for March this year is at over 20 billion US dollars, which is a growth of 18.4% over the same period last year. And now let's talk of India's defense exports. Well, they touched a record $2.63 billion in the financial year 2023-24, a growth of 32.5% over the last fiscal. Defense Minister Rajnath Singh announced this on social media platform X. He said Indian defense exports have scaled to unprecedented heights and crossed 21,000 crore Indian rupees mark for the first time in the history of independent India. India's defence exports have reached to the level of 21,081 crores Indian rupees in the financial year 2023-24, which is a spectacular growth of 32.5% over the previous fiscal. The recent figures indicate that the defence exports have grown by 31 times in the last 10 years as compared to the fiscal year 2000. 13-14, the private sector and defence public sector undertakings have made tremendous efforts in achieving the highest ever defence exports. The remarkable growth has been achieved due to the policy reforms and ease of doing business initiatives. This growth is a reflection of global acceptability of Indian defence products and technologies. In this series, a new chapter begins in India-Guyana, bilateral relations. Two aircraft manufactured by Hindustan Aeronautics Limited were delivered to Guyana. These would help in connecting remote areas, medical evacuation and disaster response. The High Commissioner welcomed Indian Air Force team visiting Guyana to deliver these aircraft. And next we take a look at what else is happening across the world. A fire broke out on Monday at the Ural Marsh factory in the Russian city of Yekaterinburg, Russia's emergencies ministry said. Ural Marsh produces equipments for mining, metalworks, cement industry and energy facilities including nuclear power plants. Visitors in Japan's Yamaguchi city floated paper dolls down the Ichinosaka River wishing for good health 
During an annual event in the city, the dolls made of traditional Tokuji Washi paper are retrieved at the lower part of the river and burnt in a bonfire at a local shrine. Hungarians observed Easter with a centuries-old tradition of dousing women with buckets of ice-cold water. Men and women dressed up in folk costumes took part in the tradition that was widely practiced across Central and Eastern Europe for centuries. And residents in Germany's capital Berlin celebrated Easter Monday with runners dressed in bunny costumes during a fun run. Some of the runners highlighted the plight of refugees by encouraging the donation of running shoes. And as we end the show, we take you to Croatia's Zagreb Zoo, where the animal, animals were treated to a festive Easter lunch on Monday. Lions, bears, meerkats and monkeys enjoyed their snacks filled with some of their favorite food. So that's all for this edition of DD India Global. Do let us know your thoughts on the news of the day. You can connect with us on Facebook, X, formerly Twitter and Instagram at DD India Live. You can also find us online at ddindia.co.in. We will be back with more news as it breaks here on DD India. I'm Tanvi Taneja. From my entire team in New Delhi, thank you for watching. Namaskar.